Okay, there we go. Yay. Well, that was quite an introduction, my brother. Thank you. That little word and prayer over offering was humbling as well. Thank you, dear. Oh, my goodness. I said to David, I'm really getting loved on by your folks this morning. Well, I've been here before, huh? And they, and they let me come back, so that's a good sign. When they let you come back. No, listen, hey, we're hungry, right? You guys traveled in. I talked to so many people that traveled in, like came in from a ways away. And uh, bless you, I didn't get to meet probably everybody. They said last night somebody was here from Colorado. Is there somebody here from Colorado? It's you. Wow. Right here? Gosh, we said, hey, but I didn't know you were from Colorado. Wow. And uh, Germany. Yeah, I met a young lady from Germany. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Amen. Spain. I, I said last night, they were telling me where everybody's from. I said, man, I'm glad I didn't know that beforehand. I'd have been under pressure. I'd have had to really preach worth your travel time. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, hey, this thing is really nice, man. Thanks. Hi, this is nice. That other one you had used to freak me out a little bit. I'd get behind and I'd say, dear brothers, we are gathered here. But uh, no, I got a lot of things on my heart. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'll tell you what I'm humbled by right now. The excitement and. Because when I preach. You can't hear it without being challenged. It causes people to grow or ignore what you heard. And, and yet people are so hungry for what's being said. It's humbling to see that much hunger in people. And it tells me that we've really wanted God and we'll go after him as much as we understand him and see him. And uh, I'm not saying this in a weird way. It's a barometer to me. I, I get more invites today to churches and to speak. It never ends. It's, it's actually, it's hard to comprehend how pursued I am to go preach places and the invites, the number of invites. I used to say I go to about five or 6% of my invites. I do about two or 3% of my invites. I go for 45 weekends. You can do the math. It's amazing that year after year, that many invites roll in and then they keep growing. And some people are, my brother said, I sent you a hundred. <laughs> I said, sorry, my brother. I just can only go to a few, but I am, I'm coming. But uh, what I'm saying is it's a barometer. There's that many people hungry for this message and it's not a, it's a message that'll bless you beyond measure if you'll yield to the truth. Like when you get free from you and yourself and self-concern and self-defense and, and self-justification and all the self that we've all lived. That's when you really understand freedom. We're freedom fast. It's freedom from you living for you where you're your main goal. Like if you're your main goal, that's bondage. That's, that's where insecurity, that's where anxiety, that's where frustration, that's where judgment and human pride. That's where all that stuff rests, but it's not rest, but that's where it abides. It finds self to attach to and it springs. All your emotions and my emotions growing up, they just came from a self-centered wellspring. Nobody had to teach you to be frustrated. It just came natural. <laughs> Nobody had to teach you to be angry, to covet, to be prideful. We, we wanted mine. Some of the first words, little ones, mine, uh, me, give me, ah, uh, ah. Little. They're little. Ah! Mine. No. Mm. Sweet. Little. Sweet. Where'd they learn that? They're so little. They didn't have time to learn that. Do you ever have a little, tiny, tiny little one get so frustrated and they actually air swing at you, like swing at you, like... <laughs> it's not because they watch UFC main event. It's just there. It's just in the instinct. It's in the nature. It's called the fall of man. It's by sheer instinct. It's in the fall of man. It's in Adam. It's not in Jesus. 
One of the biggest lies is to get to get lulled into believing that what we've been is who we are and who we're created to be. What we've been is who we became. Not who we were created to be. It's what we were as a finished product of separation from God. That's nasty. What we grew up thinking was us was actually separation from God. There's, there's no truth in it at all. You were trained by a lie. You and me, our whole lives, homeschooled in the wrong home, dwelling in the wrong place, not created for that place, got born into that place through the fall of man. And then we study, psychologically assess people. And then we come up with the human psychological wisdom, figuring it all out and telling us who we are and why and why we respond this way and why did, and why. And we got it all diagnosed and we've studied a fallen man. And then we sell to each other that this is us. But when you look to Jesus, it doesn't look anything like Jesus. And he's first born among many brethren. And he said the things I do, you'll do if you believe. And And he said, follow me. He didn't just say, sing to me because the music's right. He didn't just say, sing to me so you can get a breakthrough. He didn't just say, pray to me when you're overwhelmed. He said, follow me. That's, an, that's incredible. So I went to church up till I was about 18, regular, because mom made me. I didn't, I didn't go for any other reason. Mom made me go. She was a good mama. Really good. She's not with us anymore, but she is with him. My dad didn't want anything to do with church. He was alcoholic. My mom did the best she could. She made us go to church. I'd act like I was sleeping. And she'd say, just get up. You ain't sleeping, boy. <laughs> Every day of the week, you're up almost when the sun's coming up. And on Sunday, you're going to be sleeping at 830. I don't think so. Get out of bed, boy. <laughs> so I'd get out of bed, go to church. But when I was old enough to feel like I made my decisions, I just quit going. But I had no revelation. It's nobody else's fault, really, other than I didn't seek God. I didn't seek to know God. I was full of opinions and self-centeredness like everybody else. I was living in my own little intellectual world. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't living from my heart. My heart would tell me. Do you ever notice how your heart will tell you one thing and your head will tell you another? Yes. Yes. We've got to learn to live from our heart. You get this gospel from the heart, not the head. Right. Scripture in the gospel is made for the heart. It says, with the heart a man believes, not with the head. With the heart a man believes, and out of his mouth he makes confession unto salvation. Gospel's made for your heart. Amen. Yeah? That's why everything along the way is trying to jade your heart, harden your heart, anger your heart, frustrate your heart, and rule your heart. Yes. So all of a sudden, life is defining us. And all of a sudden, at a very young age, you think you know who you are because of the way things are and the way you've responded. And now you have personality types, and we have names and labels and letters for all that. And all of a sudden, life's just deciding you instead of the giver of it. And honestly, truthfully, at a very, very, very young age, you're nothing more than a product of what you're evolving into out of how you're responding to how it's going. And none of it has anything to do with the real truth about who you are and who you created to be. Let me, paint, let me give you a real practical example just to convict you on this so that you see it. Conviction means see it. It's not a bad word. If you were laughed at at a very young age and you recognized they were making fun of you and two of the people that were laughing you thought were friends because you hung out and played little games with and you're just kids. I'm just talking eight years old, nine years old, seven years old at a very young age and you think they're your buddies and now they're laughing at you and in a mocking way and then two other people chime in and laugh and there's feelings in that. And you're young, you're young, and you thought two of these people were your pals, you know. You played with them, and, and you did stuff with them, and you made little make-believe games up, and they were hangout kids all day with you, and now they're laughing too, and you're like, don't laugh. And they laughing, and now two more people laughing. You got to deal with that. You got to walk through that. Well, you got options. You can, you can get hurt, broken, insecure. You can feel like... 
a mockery. You can feel bad about yourself. You can feel like people don't like you. And all this insecurity starts breeding and all this self-consciousness and low esteem. Or you can harden yourself and say, well, I don't give a flip. I don't care how they are. I don't care about nobody. No way. You can laugh at me. All and all of a sudden you either become hard or you become broken. But watch, no matter how you respond, neither response is you. You're being fashioned, you're being molded, you're being shaped, you're being controlled, you're being dictated, you're being decided by other factors. None of your response has to do with who you really are. But then you grow up that way. And then more things hit. And then you get a name and people tag you. Oh, they a fighter. Oh, you better not get in her business. You better not talk him down. He'll knock you out. That boy ain't playing. And all of a sudden you grow to believe this is you. And none of it is the truth of why you're here and who you really are. It all evolves out of a lie. It's not the great potter. It's not the hand of God molding and sculpting and shaping. It's not the workmanship of the Lord. It's the workmanship of life apart from Him. With no other options but the wisdom of the world and the way that seemeth right to a man. Now you think with me. That way has never produced life. It always brings death and destruction. So all of a sudden you're right. Now you got your peer group based on your story. And now even your friendships evolve out of your pain or your trials or your circumstances. Now you got a peer group that agrees with you. Feel sorry for you. So they become your confidants and the people that you trust. And life could go on from beginning to end that way and never change. Last night I talked about Jesus coming and actually doing what he did in, in the womb of a woman and being born of Mary. Fascinating that, that he, is so, he is so aware of our value, our purpose, our potential in the truth. When he came to the earth and he stepped out in ministry and he met the multitudes and he stood in front of them, what did it say? It said he wept with compassion. Because he perceived and realized they had no shepherd. They had no one. They were sheep with no one to lead. That's amazing. What do you think was happening there? Why is Jesus crying at Lazarus' tomb? It's kind of silly. He, he's going to raise him in 40 seconds to a minute. People say, oh, see how much he loved him. They think his tears are sympathy. He's raising him in a minute or two. He's not crying because he's dead. He didn't even see he was dead. He doesn't even see death. He's the author and giver of life. He doesn't even see death. He didn't even say the little girl was dead when they were all wailing and weeping. He said she's only sleeping and they mocked him and he didn't seem to change. See, we get mocked, we get changed. That's because we don't know who we are. That's why life decides so many of us. That's why things control us. That's why what people say matters so much. Because you really don't know who you are. And then you're always guessing. And about the time you think you're getting a little settled, something shakes that thing. And now you're back to insecurity again. And self-consciousness and fear of man and self-awareness. It's happened to us, everybody in the room. I'm not that far off. So you need a family member to say the right thing and you can't even stand going to family gathering because so-and-so has never said what you need them to say. And now you're hurt and you're mad and you have a title for them as well. Mm. <laughs> Preaching right now. Come on, it's not far off. The whole room's quiet. We know we've all went through this stuff. That's because we all grew up without him. He, he's crying at Lazarus' tomb. Why is he crying? Why is he crying at Lazarus' tomb? Have we even grasped this thing? Or are we just saying, oh, see, he's so relatable. Jesus is so real. He's just crying with the people. Are you kidding me? He's telling them he's the, he's the, he's the resurrection and the life. They're crying. All they can see is death. And life is standing right in front of them. Yeah. 
Watch. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. The reason they're here is because of him. He's the Lord. He's from the beginning. He was the word. He always was. He is. He is to come. Heaven and earth's going to fade away. But the word will always be and remain. He's here from the beginning. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. He made them for a purpose. He made them for his image. He made them to be one with him. And he's face to face with the fall of man. As a man, he's standing face to face with a mentality he can't even relate to. He made them for a purpose. And that purpose was so lost that life was standing right in front of them. And they couldn't see it. All they could see was death. All they could honor was a lie. Truth was speaking in the streets every day. And all they could hear was lies and come against everything he was saying. He saw they were sheep without a shepherd and he wept with compassion. Why? Because he's face to face with people that he made for the similitude of God that looked nothing like him. And when they saw him, they couldn't see. And he wept. This thing is real. From the time we can remember, we've had certain emotions and attitudes and feelings. And then we start relating to them and we think that's just the way it is. This is us. It, none of it is us. This, this born again thing is die to live. It was kind of funny. The sister said, I'm not dead like Dan Moeller. But it's true. We, we, not that you're not dead like Dan Moeller, but it's true. We got to die. You, we don't preach death. We, we always just preach forgiveness. <laughs> it's one thing to be forgiven. Praise God. I'm glad about it. That's what empowers you to be changed. You're not forgiven to be forgiven. You're forgiven to get brand new. To start new life. To get crucified in Christ. And put off the old. And put on the new. And become what he paid for. You're not just forgiven. There's a grace to transform you. You're, you become brand new. You're born again. As if you never were born before. And all of a sudden you throw away your way. And get a hold of the way. Yeah? Yeah? <clears throat> Kim Clement, I don't know if you know who he was, but he started that. You get it. Give up your way and go ahead and take Yahweh. <laughs> it's not your way, it's Yahweh. He used to sing that. <laughs> it was really good. But it's true. We were trained by a lie, people. I talk about feelings versus faith all the time. And, and, and people over the years have, not in a confrontive way, just crying out like, but Dan, I mean, I'm, I'm really trying to walk this out. But I mean, we got feelings. It's not like we don't have them. And then they'll say, well, God gave us emotions. And they'll try to pull spiritual on me. Well, God gave us emotions. And I'm like, don't you credit him for the crazy things we grew up with called emotions. God didn't give you the emotions you grew up with. Adam gave you those. All your emotions are hinged on a self-centered wellspring. If you weren't living for yourself, you wouldn't act the way you act. You wouldn't feel the way you feel. You wouldn't even think the way you think. If you weren't thinking for you. Do you know how many people are Christians for themselves? That's why they're frustrated in their Christianity. Because it's not about his great name. It's about their well-being. You couldn't be frustrated with Christianity if you understood relationship and communion with God. And you were a sacrifice for the kingdom of God. That you were seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you love not your own life unto death, you wouldn't be frustrated. <laughs> That's what's wrong with me. Like, I get it now. For a while. I get it a little more than I used to. So I'm just a little worse. I'm a little more intense. But when you see this thing, you understand why Jesus wept. 
It's not self-righteousness. It's not pride. You see, people ain't thinking like they're created to think. And they're good people, good-hearted people. People that love Jesus and understand that he died and forgave their sins. And they, 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 they're sorry for the lives they lived. And they want this thing. But then they live from the same places. Still looking for some of the same things. All of a sudden, we're still trying to find ourselves this way. All of a sudden, we come to a gathering to get something from it. Instead of be something in it. There's a difference. All of a sudden you go to church to be loved instead of be love. And then you leave and get tricked and say, well, I don't think people love me like they could. And I'm thinking, well, who did you love? Well, I ain't going back to that church. It wasn't very loving. I say it should have been. You were there. Should have been. You were there. Do you see how they've been tricked into it? It's all about me and what I can get for me. I mean, I'm not against Burger King. I like Burger King. Burger King's good burger. I don't eat there much, but when I do, thank you, Jesus. But it's like, have it your way in five minutes. It ain't have it your way. Just everything's catering to the individual. And it's, it's, it's a seducing, blinding, lying. It's, it draws us in. It's our whole lives. Businesses and, and things. It's all catering to you and your convenience and your benefit and your desire. And it's just all about you. And then all of a sudden we're preaching the gospel that way. And all of a sudden it's all about your blessing. All about your breakthrough. All about your protection. All about your provision. And if any of those things are in question, you're freaking out and wondering where God is. And you haven't surrendered anything. You're just waiting to get more in your basket. You haven't even given Him your life. You're just looking for His favor. You've got to be careful that we don't preach this gospel to serve us instead of transform us. Because I promise you, there's too many discouraged Christians going to church. And when I look at my Bible, discouraged Christians isn't scriptural. Paul had some serious trials. And he talked about it boldly. And he wasn't discouraged a bit. See, if you're seeking first the kingdom, it changes everything. So when people do you wrong, it ain't about being done wrong. It's about shining and living Jesus. Because here's what dominates your life. You haven't been done wrong. You've been done right. So all of a sudden you're not trouble driven anymore. You're living from the answer. All of a sudden you ain't somebody with a prayer list of problems. You're manifesting answers that already flooded your heart. All of a sudden the truth has come and it's made you free. All of a sudden you ain't a person with a trial and a challenge. You're a person with a victory and a song. Come on. See, but if you wake up for your well-being instead of his great name, you'll get that mixed up and it'll get blurry and you'll be sure you're right because everybody else is telling me, I can't believe. And yeah, oh, you must be bummed. Oh, man, we're just praying for peace right now. And, and all of a sudden we're reduced again to just trying to make it, just trying to make it, just trying to make it. And in that arena, you can only live every day as good as the day is going. And then you lose your effectiveness. You lose your influence. You lose walking in the light as he's in the light. That's why we laughed silly last night when I used the illustration of Jesus bummed out. Can I say, can you picture Jesus bummed out? And everybody just laughs before you even act anything out. Because the thought of Jesus bummed out is hysterical. Well, he said, follow me. He said, the things I do, you'll do. He's first born among many brethren. He said, as he is, so are right here in this world. Come on, if it's hysterical, the thought of Jesus bummed out, we ought to challenge bummed out. We ought to say, I bet my motive needs to change. I bet my circumstances are real. I bet it did happen this way, but I bet the way I'm perceiving it isn't the way Jesus is looking. I bet I ain't in his eye. I bet I'm not looking through his way. I bet I'm... I bet I'm tricked into thinking the way that seemeth right to a man. And that's why there ain't no life in this situation. Jesus poured into men. He poured his life into men. And at a critical time, them men all ran. Come on, that's a hurting, discouraged, quitting pastor that needs a sabbatical for life. 
Hello? Because we're so busy building something and can't trust nobody and they're in, inconsistent and can't even count on, count on nobody. And I'm trying to do this and I'm just mad and I'm done with ministry. I can't believe you called me to this God. I don't even see a temptation of that in Jesus. I bet he's seeing something we ain't been seeing. I bet he's living from a place that we need to consider. I bet he's really thinking for the kingdom first. I bet this is all about the name of his father. I bet you this is all about loving folks no matter where they're at. Trusting and believing that love will bring out the best in somebody. I bet it is. I bet we don't love God first. I bet we see his first love. And I bet you the enemy knows scripture and he just wants to twist the gospel a little, make it about everything else. To where now we feel convicted. Now we see our need for a savior. We're sure aware of our sin and we wonder why he loves us so much. And whew, I hope he does. And, and now I better serve him, pay him back, do something. All of a sudden now I owe him and I have this obligatory thing with the Lord instead of this intimate relationship where he fathers me. Are you with me? Come on. This thing has been so muddy. Yes, Lord. And, it, and it's tried to take advantage of the lie we were all trained by from little up. We were born into Adam. Come on, let's not miss this. I, I'm, I'm making a strong statement today. We're, this thing is not just about being forgiven. It's about getting a new mind and, and, and in the spirit of your mind being renewed. And, and I looked up renewed. It means thinking like we've never thought before. Amen. What? Well, how do I get new thoughts that I never thought before? Where do they come from? From new life, from Him. Yeah. From the Word of the living God. He came and showed me a new and living way. He modeled what I was created for. That's why He said, follow me. He fulfilled what man failed. He said, this is what life looks like. This is what life in the Father looks like. See? See? But because we don't understand that, we're afraid of adversity. We're afraid of people doing us wrong. We got little walls up and we can't trust nobody. And you got to be careful. And it's teachings are in the church. Be careful who you let too close because you just don't want to be burned again. Burned! Jesus wasn't burned. He wasn't hurt. And he wasn't a doormat. He wasn't an enabler. He's a living epistle of love and he's my hero and I'm going to follow him. Amen. You're not going to talk me out of it. Nobody. You, you can come up with all the rationale you want. Well, yeah, but if you just keep on loving people, I mean, you got to be that tough love, brother. Just be careful. Well, who's going to hold them accountable? Certainly not you. Come on, man. I don't remember hearing any testimony where God just stormed into somebody's life and said, you better knock it off or I'm done with you and I ain't never looking back. You see that road? I'm on it. If you don't change now, I'm on it and I ain't looking back. And then you get some obligatory relationship. Some automatum relationship. Some conditional relationship. Where you're on thin ice and you wonder if you're even on or not. You wonder if this thing is even cooking or not. You wonder if you stopped it or is it still going. That's what Christians do a lot and it proves we don't understand the love of God. We're trying to still get something from Him and we want to know we're connected. You're so much more than connected if you understand. You were His choice created in His image from the beginning. Love never fails. He'll never change his mind. On your darkest, most rebellious day, he said, I know who you are and that ain't you at all. And I've known you from the beginning and I love you. And my blood is speaking better things over your life. Why does he do that? Because love never fails. He doesn't change his mind about why you're here, whether you ever get it or not. That truth remains. And you always have the privilege through repentance and faith to step into it. You say, well, I've wasted too much time. I've passed too much. Stop. He's the redeemer of everything. He changes everything. It's never too late to be transformed. It's never too late to go after him. It's never too late to say yes. You can't say, but I knew better and did it anyway. No, you thought you knew better, but you see it more now. See, we hold ourselves to something. 
through intellect and words that isn't the reality of our revelation and then we get condemned for it and that proves that we're out of bounds because he didn't come to condemn you he came to save you and get you out of that thing so if you're finding a reason to stay there you're being deceived he's saying come out of that place you judging yourself you're not your own judge stop it he said i didn't come to judge you but that you might be saved well, brother, it's too late. I mean, I repeated this twice and I've read Galatians 6 and I've read Hebrews 10. Stop it. Your heart's crying out. You want change. You care. You're so alive inside. You're not a whatever. You care. You're having trouble sleeping. Your conscience is going like this. There's something inside of you that's been preserved by grace. God wants to reach you. You ain't cut off or you wouldn't care. Jesus is amazing. Am I am I tense right now? This is the gospel. Guys. He shed his blood for this thing. We'll get intense about a whole lot of things. Don't let's get intense about the truth. If the truth is what makes you free, let's go after it. Let's locate it. In your own heart, you have to decide what that is. He said, he said, who do men say that I am? And they had a whole lot of answers. Then he looked right in their eyes and said, who do you say that I am? Because you'll never live beyond what you see. You might appreciate my faith. You might not appreciate my faith. You might be encouraged by my faith. You might be freaked out by my faith. You might like my passion. You might say, calm down. It, none of that will take you where you're paid for. Paid for. Where'd he go? Paid for. The house, remember? <laughs> Only you can have faith for you. You can ride somebody's faith and be encouraged by it for a small season. My own children. It's, look, there's a time you got to grow past the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If he's not your God, you haven't been with him. You don't know him. You know the God of the word, but you don't know the God that lives inside of you. you, you he said, who do men say that I am? And there was all kinds of answers. And he looked right in their eyes and said, but who do you say that I am? Every Christian. Every person seeking him has to answer that question in their own heart. Who do you say that I am? Because the answer to that question decides how you fly. It decides what your life is going to look like. And you understand what a man sees and believes by how he conducts his life. And your life lived reveals your faith. Not your speech. Not your participation in worship. Your life lived reveals your faith come on there's hope in this more than hope this thing isn't beating down it's lifting up it's exposing things to set us free yeah come on you think god hasn't seen all these little misnomers and all these little fallacies you don't think he has seen every little quirk and every deception to the fall of man and how our minds have worked and our wrong motives and even sometimes our wrong flat out intentions yes but the gospel hasn't changed. The blood's still speaking better things. We probably ought to run to him, my brother. Not run from him. Not talk around this thing. You say, well, how do I get that revelation? Who do you say to him? You got to look at his life. You got to look at his word. You got to see how he handled situations. You got to realize that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. He didn't sit down and cry because they betrayed him. He took bread and followed this thing through, broke it, representing his life about to die. He took the cup, representing the blood that was about to spill, and he passed it around the table, said, I'm giving my life for you. The men that, that, that ran when he was struck. The boys that we think were his boys. They should have been his armor bearers. They should have had his back. They all said, we'll die for you. And they ran the first chance. They weren't ready to die for nobody. They were living for themselves and couldn't see it. And Jesus loved them right through it all. And when he raised from the dead, the first thing out of his mouth to Mary was, you go tell my brethren. He didn't say, you go tell those low-life, two-faced, backstabbing, no good for nothing. Come on, that's what we do when people do us wrong. 
Some of us, we have a teacher we still remember. And it ain't a good memory. You're like, oh, that woman. Oh, that man made me mad. So arrogant. I just wish if I was older, I'd have punched him in the mouth. Some of us hold that stuff in life. We, we weigh things outside. We, got, we let stuff get under our skin instead of getting new skin. And then, and then we bring Jesus into our life and some of that stuff is still under our skin. And now you got this weird mixed bag of him and you. That's a deadly mixed drink there. That don't even work. I mean, some things work good together. You get vodka and a little bit of Pepsi or Coke, that works. I mean, I'm not a drinker. Don't get panicky. There's things that work. And people say, ooh, that's good. And it mixed me up one of this, one of that. One of the most lethal mixed drinks on the planet is a little bit of him and a little bit of you. One of the worst mixed drinks on the planet is just half truth. Because it's half true. And you really can't define it or locate it because it's half true. So it's half true, but ugh. the devil's a master. I'm not boasting in him. He's a master at half truth. He, he loves people to go to church. I'm convinced. I think he compels people to go because he believes they'll get just enough religion and have just enough of themselves to get inoculated and build up against the real bam and all of a sudden their knowledge will puff them up and their church attendance will suffice and all of a sudden their christian behavior will qualify and, and all of a sudden they're just doing the thing man yeah this is was it true <laughs> she just want me to twirl i don't know <laughs> All of a sudden you're doing all this. All of a sudden you got Christian ringtone, Christian screensaver, Christian t-shirt, Christian bumper sticker, daily devotion. And don't know him because you're not walking in love and you're in unforgiveness and you complain and you got so many issues and you do all those things to feel qualified instead of to be empowered to shine. And all of a sudden you're putting effort in to become something you already are through him qualified. You're already accepted in the beloved. Amen. Of course we're called to live acceptable, but that's because you know you're accepted. Yeah. If you're trying to live acceptable without knowing you're accepted, you're always condemned and you feel like you're short. Amen. So you try to do a little more instead of be a little more. Yeah. Come on, it gets all muddy and backwards. Yeah. And all of a sudden we've learned how to do Jesus. And don't shine. All of a sudden we learn how to do better church instead of be her. And if we miss this thing, we'll miss the whole reason why he came. If we fail to become love, if we fail to walk in love and live by his spirit in, in love, we miss the purpose of him shedding his blood. And we've got reduced to thinking it's going to heaven someday. Instead of your will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom right here. Go preach saying. The kingdom of God is here. Amen. You, you look what up that means. That means it's, it's at hand. It's within reach. The kingdom of God is here. You say, where is it? I'm looking at it. It's the truth. Christ in who? Christ in who? The hope of glory. glory. You know what glory means? Any manifested, made known, seen attribute of God is the glory of God revealed. Watch. The Christ in you is the hope of God being seen and known. The Christ in who? In you. No wonder there's a strategy to keep you discouraged, self-conscious, self-centered, and misguided. I promise you, I, I, my pastor, he... I, I laugh when I preach this because he, he looks at me funny. He gets nervous when I preach, I guess, because he, he, he's, he's a good pastor. Pastor Don, he, I know he doesn't totally agree with me on this. It's okay. I don't need to agree with. The devil could care less that you go to church. And when you start going to church, it might be the most dangerous time in your life. 
Because if you don't get the true message and surrender and sell out, you might get religious and let everything take the place of knowing him and live there for 50 years. We're so, so intent on getting head nods, check marks, and confession sheets that we might not have emphasized on transformation and new life and living by the Spirit and change to where spouses bear witness of their spouse. My spouse, he's he been coming here for three years. He ain't the same man. I had to get to know him again. He's awesome. We ought, to, we ought to have testimonies like crazy like that. Instead of, hey, can we talk? We've been coming here three years. I'm hoping we have enough pool to get an appointment because we're really struggling. That's the normal appointment. It's because we're struggling. Now watch this. The struggling far outweighs the testimonies. Now that's a giveaway. That we're still trying to deal with each other instead of love one another. Come on. It's a, it's a giveaway. It's an indictment against us. 90% of counseling, 90 some percent is people struggling with people and stuff. True? Pastors, leaders, anybody? Pastor, leader, anybody do any counseling? Am I telling the truth? 90 some percent of counseling is people struggling with each other. Struggling with stuff. Issues. Bothered. I wonder if we get this thing. I wonder if you let the gospel teach you this weekend Freedom Fest and you really would go free. Teach you that when you wake up in the morning, nobody owes you nothing. That life is a gift. And you get to live it in him for his great name. And there ain't nobody on the earth that owes you a thing today. Because it was the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And you're going to live from the kingdom. And not let your little heart get hurt anymore. And broke anymore. And failed expectation anymore. And then the person that did it is the reason you ain't shining. That's idolatry. Us, <laughs> come on. It don't get no clearer than that. That's about as straight as it's going to come. That's straight. Come on. You can't live beyond your motive. You can listen to a thousand sermons. But if you don't let that truth change the why behind your life. And you don't wake up for a different reason than you woke up before. Why will anything look different? Why will you respond different? And then you get reduced to just having God work on your behalf to make everything go the way you wish. And now you're preference driven and your preference becomes Lord. And you're only as good as it's going. And now you even have issues with God. Because why isn't he answering your prayers? And why does he let him keep pressuring you? And why doesn't he change your boss? Or give you a new job? Oh, come on. I'm not that far off on this thing. I pastored long enough to know there are common requests. People laboring and struggling. You sit down, they sigh, and they say, well, I'm just a little frustrated. No, I'm not supposed to be mad at God. I mean, I'm not really mad at God. I just don't understand. Okay, calm down and talk to me. Well, I'm working this job, and it's so awful. I'm just tired of hearing F-bombs. I'm working with this boss that's so irrational, and I've been praying, and I'm putting in 20 applications, and I don't get no phone calls, and I felt like this lady prophesied over me, God's going to give me a new job and a new season, and, 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 and I just don't know why I haven't even gotten a new job, and he leaves me stuck in this hellhole. You think that ain't a prayer request out there? You think that ain't a common tone of counsel? That thing is out there everywhere, right there. That thing I just imitated. And I'm like, whoa, we have no clue why God sent his son. We sing it's all about him and prove it is all about me. And how I feel and what ain't right and where you been, Lord. He's not your table waiter. You don't give your steak back and tell him it ain't done right. And then not tip him. Because he ain't waited real well. He's not your table waiter. He's called to be the Lord of your life. He's not here to make your job better. He's not here to make your boss treat you right. He's here to make you change so you look like him. So you be at your workplace exactly what he would be if he was there. And, and, and I'm pretty sure 
that the reason you didn't get a response to all them other inquiries and job applications and resumes is because God won't enable you to stay that way by letting you go somewhere else because you'll take that same twisted thing there. And He loves you way too much to pull you out of there. He'd rather leave you there till you get a revelation. Because if he just moves you to make you happy, something's going to go wrong here. Somebody's going to be hard to bear with here. And now you want to go somewhere else. And 10 jobs later, you're wondering why everybody's so crazy. And God, I wish you'd change people. And he's going. And if you slowed down and calmed down enough to listen, you'd hear him loud and clear. It's all about you being transformed, walking in love. It's not what people aren't and don't see. Stop letting that be you. Let me be the light of your life. Follow me. Hello. <laughs> Do you know one of the biggest scriptural realizations of not understanding why Jesus came is when people just complain. Because when you complain, it's a dead giveaway. You're self-centered. You, you're not happy with the way it's going and how it's affecting you. And what it's costing you and what it's putting you in the middle of. And what it, Complaining is a sign that you've been pulled from understanding. And it's a dead giveaway to the enemy that it's really not about his great name. It's about your well-being in the moment. Paul said, don't you ever complain. He said, I'm writing this as your admonishment. Don't you ever follow their example in the wilderness and complain like they did. They had everything. They had the sea splitting. They had food showing up in the morning on the ground. They, 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 they had fire coming over them at night when it got cold in the desert. And you look around and it don't look like God's anywhere, but he's everywhere. And, and, and they would never be making it. And you know what happened after years? They start saying, this old worthless bread. Here it is again. Same old stuff. Day after day after day. You think our God could be a little more diverse. And all of a sudden, supernatural. Sustaining, providing grace. In the middle of nowhere. To teach them who he really is. And the best they could do is complain because it wasn't good enough. Who he was wasn't good enough. You know how I know that's right? Because Paul said, don't you tempt Christ like they did in the wilderness. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Devoured by the one who devours. I looked up tempting Christ and what they did. They called the manna worthless bread. The manna is a type and shadow of the gospel that's to come. The bread that comes down from heaven. His name is Jesus. What he's saying is, don't you get frustrated and complain and start saying things like, well, this gospel ain't enough. Well, it don't work for me. Well, God's way ain't happening. Well, I don't feel blessed. And all of a sudden, you're just telling the enemy, hey, I go to Redemption House, but I ain't surrendered. I don't have a revelation. Keep punching me because I'm about to go out. And then as it keeps coming, you know what you say? Why is God letting all this happen to me? Where is he at? I've been praying and praying. Why is God doing this? And you'll find out one day he wasn't doing nothing. But sitting there waiting to watch over his word to perform it. But it was all about you, so his word wasn't nowhere near your mouth. And when you did quote it, it was just in principle form, hoping to get changed because you were overwhelmed and bitter and frustrated. And all of a sudden you turned the gospel into abracadabra. Instead of relationship. And the enemy just took advantage. Of where you were sitting. Come on. Don't tempt Christ like they did in the wilderness. What's he saying? Don't you get into complaining. And ever believe the finished work is not enough for your life. That the gospel plan, that the truth behind the cross isn't your answer. Don't you ever start getting so deceived that you believe God's way isn't the way. To where you have some other wisdom, some other response, some other reaction. 
He said, don't you tempt Christ. And don't you say what he did isn't your answer. By not surrendering and living the same. When you preach this intense, you know what people are tempted to think? Well, brother, you're being a little insensitive. You don't even know my story. You don't even know what I've been through. You don't even know the hell I've been in. You don't know what they did to me for four years. You don't know. That's what people do. And then they talk themselves out of the conviction of the truth and let their life and the way it's been for them decide them. And that becomes their story instead of him becoming their story. Because here's how you flip the question. You know how when they came to Jesus in the Bible, they'd ask him questions and it would always say how they were trying to trap him, trick him or catch him. And did you, do you know how it says that? Did you notice that whenever they ask him a question and it states in your Bible their intention was wrong? He never answered their question. He always repeated a question. He said, let me ask you a question. He never fed that thing because their hearts were twisted. He never even gave them a sincere answer. They said, well, if what is it? Well, he said, well, let me ask you a question. Boom, and he just flipped it on him. People say, well, if God's good, why did he let this happen when I was six? Well, if God's good, how come I lost so-and-so? If God's good, why? That's what people say. And he would say, let me ask you a question. Because he was so quick to ask questions. God would say, if he wasn't good, then why did he send his son while we were all yet sinners? See, Maybe we're trying to find his goodness in the wrong place. And maybe self-centeredness has us looking at our lives instead of looking to him. And maybe we're taking life personal and missing the gospel instead of taking the gospel personal and seeing life for the first time clear. Oh, this is solid. I hope you, yeah, I can feel life in it. <laughs> See, because watch, the reason I'm saying that, I'm not boasting in my preaching, it's not me. But watch, really. Whether you believe what I'm saying or not, man, I'm seeing this thing. I'm going to live it more. So if you see me again, I'm going to be a little more. Ah! <laughs> and I'm going to be like, hey, guys, keep me in prayer. I mean, I'm trying to hang in there. <laughs> Friend of mine just texted me the other week. I know him well, and he's a good Christian brother. And he said, probably a silly question, but how you doing, man? And I said, oh. Well, dot, 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 I guess I'm okay. And he sent me back like 10,000 laughy guys and said, that sounded really crazy coming through on your text. But isn't it true? We ask people how they're doing and what, what's their answer? Their two biggest struggles and keep me in prayer. Now, I'm not being mean. Those things are real and they're challenged by certain things. But it's affecting our demeanor, our disposition, and our purpose in life. And all of a sudden you turn inward and it's all about your struggle instead of all about him and the answer. Yeah. See, because even if people are doing you wrong, you can still shine. Even if you're struggling through symptoms, you can still shine. You never let what you're going through become who you are. Because what he went through is where you find the real you. Yeah. So he already answered who you are. Yeah. You're Christ in you. So there's no, there's no hit on this. This isn't condemning. This is life giving. This gets you out of lies. I talked to a brother in the back tonight. He was, or today, this morning, he was so humble. He said, you know, I was doing that. He said, I was, I was getting frustrated. And I said, yeah, and what happens is, and he said, yeah, exactly. It is, it pulls you out of this thing. Now, who knows it wasn't that brother's heart? Who knows that he didn't sit and think, okay, I'm going to have an attitude today. I'm going to be mad. I'm just frustrated and I feel justified. I'm not talking to a room of hypocrites. I'm not talking to people that woke up looking for a way to miss God and get away with it. I'm not talking to a room of hypocrites. I'm talking to his children. Yeah? And we want him. And the more we see him the way he is, the more we'll be like him. So we just, yeah? So none of this is too hard to bear. None of this is like, man, lighten up, brother. I don't even know if I'm saved. Are you kidding me? You're getting answers. You say, well, I got a long way to go. No, see, you got somewhere to go. It's amazing how we've been tricked into being problem driven. 
It's always about what's wrong. Usually when we pray for each other, usually when we pray for the sick, it's always about what's wrong. It's always about the symptom. It's always about the pain. It's always about I couldn't sleep and I haven't slept for three weeks. And now you're striving. You're like, God, I got to sleep. And then you go to bed and you're so worked up and you're so misfocused. And Yeah? When do we ever just take a breath and just be loved by him? When do you ever say, you know what, listen, for a second here, I mean, I want to go to sleep. And I believe it's my, my privilege in the children's bread. But, but listen... I just know you love me. And whether I've slept or not in the last three weeks, I need to refocus and say, you know what? What you did on that cross is amazing. And the way you forgive me and the way you let me stand righteous in your sight. Man, I don't want to lose first things and first love. God, thank you. You're so good. And stay in that place of knowing him and that union of being in him and, and being loved by him. Does that make sense? Because we're desperate. We're driven. Who would agree that most of the time our motive in prayer is the problem? Rarely is it the answer. Rarely is it the promise. We just know what scripture says. So we're principle driven. So we're quoting the principles to get the thing to change. But if we're not careful, it's super impersonal. And if it don't happen, you're in a quandary. And in time, your disposition is wrecked. It's a dead giveaway. You follow me? We're in covenant with God. All that is mine is yours. That's covenant. And he said all that is his is ours. That's covenant. Two have become one. It's not, hey God, you said all that is yours is mine. And then you quote it, give it up. You said I can have whatever I ask believe in. This is covenant. Don't forget the front end, your end. All that is mine is yours. Watch my attitude. My disposition, my nature, my heart motives, my perspectives. Everything that I am, spirit, soul, and body is yours for your glory and your great name. Let all that you are come into me because I yield all that I am to you. Make us one. You start praying like that when nobody's looking. Whew, change your life. I'll lock you in. There's folks that have known me my whole Christian life. And they say, you are always the same. Why? Because the truth has never changed. Yeah, that's good. So the only thing I can do is get tricked into get my eyes off the truth. And let life take advantage of me. Instead of let him settle and establish me. People that know me my whole Christian life, they know me for consistency. What you see is what you get. That man is this way and that way and he's getting worse like he says. And <laughs> That's what they say. But it's pretty awesome. Because his grace is sufficient. But the, the truth never changes. This is going to sound almost corny to folks. But no matter what I'm going through. And how I'm tempted to feel when I open that book. It says the same thing it said. Before it all started breaking out. So if it's the same. Why am I changed? Because I mustn't have my eyes single anymore. I must be yeah button or what if and, and I must be drawing my identity through something other than truth. And all of a sudden my freedom is. <laughs> can I can I stretch you this morning or something? Yeah, bring it. Look, bring I, this is going to sound extreme and radical because it's the example I have. It says it's off the wall. You could all turn on me completely. Start posting right and left, accusing, talking. You can't possibly touch what I see and who he is in me. Like, I'm safe now. Like, people have no power to take away what I see. They can only encourage it and cheer it on. Nobody can take it. The only thing you can do, the only influence you can have in my life is positive. You can just cheer me on, and I'm pretty cheered on, but you can cheer me on. <laughs> you, can, you can encourage me, is what I'm saying. But how can you dis-encourage me? That would be discouraged. The only way that happens, if I get tricked back into drawing my identity from you, let my need rest on what you're giving me, and take into heart what you say about me. Now be real with me. Our whole lives we were ruled. 
by each other. And our way is cut people off, shut them, cut them out. I ain't talked to them for five years. You don't realize for five years they've been painting your portrait. For five years they've been sculpting your life. Because if they wouldn't have did what they did or wasn't who they were in your life, you wouldn't be the way you are. That means they have strong influence in your being and you think you're winning because you didn't talk to them for five years. And the whole time they're sculpting your life. And at the end of five years, whether you like it, agree with it or not, you're somewhat a product of them. And you think you're winning because you ain't. But they have been shaping you from the inside. That's why unforgiveness is so wretched. And it's such enmity to God. And it's come natural to us. You know what Christians say all the time to me? Christians. They say, well, brother, give me time. It's hard. I mean, I'm working on it. I'm trying to forgive. Because we have such a grid for unforgiveness because we were born into self-centeredness. Wonder if God took the initiative to live in rightness for a day. And he went back to the beginning of time and everything he created man to be and everything man has become and everything we've done and all the times we knew to do right and still did wrong. Wonder if God had a beef with that and laid it all out and just vented for a day. Wouldn't be good, would it? Then why would we think it's ever good if we live where he never is? First of all, we know he won't do that. Why do we give ourselves permission to be where he isn't? Come on. I'm talking to every individual heart. If you're sitting there and saying, well, I hope my spouse is listening, then I'm definitely talking to you. <laughs> She's serious. If you elbowed your spouse, I was talking to you. And if you elbowed them back, well, you're both involved. <laughs> do you know how people do that? They listen to the sermon for the person that they say they're praying for. Is the person they're bothered by. I'm on. <laughs> the only reason you want them to change is to make your day go a little smoother. It ain't compassion and love. It's like if you would change that man, it would be so much easier to live. If you change that woman, whoo. I could really praise you, Lord. <laughs> and then you listen to a sermon like this. And then you see her in her chewing gum pack. And now she's reading the back label and ingredients. And you're like, you foul, destructive devil. You loose her. You let her go. She should be hearing this. God, get her attention. And the whole time he wants you to be hearing. And you got your eyes on her and the gum wrapper. And you praying in tongues thinking she's the problem. <laughs> Trying to rebuke some distractive spirit out of the service. Because you need her to hear that word. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Are we okay? Hey, it's Freedom Fest. We ought to go for freedom. Can I be honest? Anything outside of what I'm saying has its levels of bondage. And all of a sudden, you're constrained to one another. And you're only as good as men are doing you. Instead of as good as he is. That's why there's not a ton of joy in the body of Christ. The joy in the body of Christ gets marked as flaky and facade because we're like looking for moments of ah, an order calls of joy. No, it's supposed to be good tidings of great joy. The of great joy means joy is the automatic response of seeing and understanding. Your heart is elated and overwhelmed and it's unspeakable. Yeah. We, we've had joy dictated by a lot of other things. So we're seeking happiness and we've got it all blown up. And joy. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Well, you could tell we don't understand the good tidings because the great joy has slipped. And all of a sudden we're a product of how things are going instead of who he is in us. And all of a sudden life is speaking way louder than truth. Yeah? Come on, good tidings of, which will be to, whoo, everybody's in. So what are you going to believe? Going to believe your feelings? Going to believe somebody else's words and actions? 
Are you going to believe Jesus' life in his word? Yes. Yes. These signs will follow those that. Believe. So you're going to be a believer? Because yes. everybody's believing something. Yes. What are you believing? Who do you say that I am? Your answer to that question is vital. And if all you're doing is praying for God to change things around your life, you might miss the greatest gift of all. New life. Becoming what he paid for. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Is it really that late? Yes. Doing good, brother. No, there were some things on my heart that I wanted to talk about a little sure, bit today. Sure, sure. And I stood up there and just poof. No, well, we got, we got lunch coming. And... <laughs> Let me ask you something quick. We can do this. I told a couple last night, it was on my heart last night. I said, it's amazing you asked me that because it was on my heart for today. And I had all these things. You could tell these things were in me. If I didn't say these things, I'd have blew up. You'd have saw me just poof. I'd have just been all over the place. Yeah. People don't understand. You get up here, you, you kneel down, and you don't have a need to preach. You're not drawing your identity from preaching. You never asked to travel. You never asked to pastor. People just saw Jesus in your life, recognized your relationship and all this stuff. Well, here, I'm pastor. No, I ain't pastor. I'm just a warehouse working in love with Jesus. You're supposed to be a pastor. I don't know nothing about pastor. Months go by, and all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, I want you to do that. Really? Yeah. Okay. And I'm... I'm, I'm pastoring and traveling ministry and itinerant ministry. I didn't have a good impression. The ones that passed through my church were pushing to get in at all about honorarium. And I felt like men were using the gospel and calling, if possible, or gifting as a way of living instead of to manifest truth. So I said in my heart, I'll never travel and minister. That seems weird. People are using the gospel as a job. It's like an occupation. It's weird. There's contracts and signs and it's true. King bed. My armor bearer needs a king bed. I'm not, I'm not. Dasani water. That was before Fiji even came out. And, and then all that other stuff that's out there now. I'm talking years ago. I remember Dasani water. And I'm like, you, what? So in my heart, I said, I'll never do this. And guess what? All I do is. All I do is travel and preach. No, no. Deer Park, I almost finished it. I'd have finished it if it was Dasani, but. I just drank as much as I could take. As much as I felt like Covenant would cover. No. I'm messing up bad right now. <laughs> So here I am traveling. I never asked for any of this. So when I kneel, I'm humbled. I mean, you humbled my heart. I looked at him. I said, listen to her. She's loving on me like. And you just, it was so genuine. And I was sitting there like, stop. And then Joey gets up there and I'm like, stop. And people are like, you know what I'm doing when I'm kneeling down here? Anybody ever see me kneel down here? You know what I'm doing? I'm not just kneeling because he's the Lord. I'm humbled. I'm kneeling and I'm saying, what an honor. I'm wearing this microphone. I'm going to turn it on in a second. God, you know this room. I don't even know most of these people. You, they're traveling in front of you. You know the room. You know people through and through. You know every detail in this room. And if, if David handed you a mic, if you clipped this thing on in a minute and spoke for an hour and a half, you know exactly what you'd say. And I ain't got no need to preach. So when I get up there, you got to say through my lips what you'd say if they handed you a mic. Or I ain't got no business saying nothing. Because I'm not here to preach a sermon. I didn't study for a sermon. I ain't got no sermon notes. You got to say what you would say if they handed you a mic today. And then I stand up and do you see how I explode? It ain't my fault. <laughs> you can't have planned the way it is when I'm up here. And I said, he got a firecracker right out of the gate. Firecracker. You don't, I don't even think about it. You get up here and all of a sudden, <laughs> illustrations, examples, stuff I haven't even thought about in 24 hours. It's, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I think this is an agreement. I think it's working. 
And people say, well, calm down. You don't understand. Well, when you speak, don't range your voice. Try to, you don't understand. You get up here and it's just, it's a blur. It's just, it's, you don't even know what's going on. It just comes. And you hear it and you're speaking as fast as you're here. It's just coming out like, and you think I got anything to do with that? You think I'm well studied? I've been with him. But I never studied to preach. Ever. You know what the Lord told me a long time ago? Don't you ever read your Bible to preach a sermon. Ever. He said, don't you ever read your Bible to preach a sermon. He said, only read your Bible to know me. And only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And that will carry weight. That's what he told me. So I took him serious, and that's what happens to me. I never read my Bible to preach. I read my Bible to know him. That's why I'm confident. That's why I come across the way I do. Because I actually believe. Well, it's not my doctrine. It's not my theology. It's my life. That's why there's so much passion behind it. Because I'm just preaching us. Yeah. <sighs> If I ask this question, I'm going to ask this question quick. I'm going to see if we have grace to do this. You guys can help me. Your prayer people are here. We'll do it as quick as I can. If I said baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues, understanding, receiving, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you'd say, I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit and power to be a witness. I understand other tongues comes into play all the time because it's the only outward manifestation in the Bible. But praying in other tongues isn't the only evidence. You receive Holy Spirit by faith just like you get born again. But it's imperative that you get to know him and that the person of the Holy Spirit comes into your life and empowers you to be a witness. It's imperative. Jesus told him not to do anything to tarry until he comes. It's amazing because in John 20, he breathed on them and said, receive Holy Spirit. So it seems like they got the Holy Spirit. So people say, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I believed. No, no, no. You got a reborn, recreated spirit. Life came inside of you and replaced the death that was in you. Because in John 20, he breathed and said, receive Holy Spirit. But in Luke, the last chapter of Luke, he said, tarry in the city. The promise of the Father will come upon you. Be empowered when the Holy Spirit comes. Well, wait a minute. I thought you just breathed on us and we received the Holy Spirit. Why do we got to wait for what you just breathed into us? It's a totally different experience than born again. In Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul came across some disciples. They were wearing a certain garment that in that culture and day, they, it revealed they were following something. He said, hey, he said, to whom, in, in whom we were baptized? Who are you guys following? And they said, oh, we were baptized in, by John. He said, oh, my goodness, John. He was the one crying out in the wilderness. He was the forerunner. He was the one that was proclaiming the one to come. And at that point, he preached Jesus to them, right? But, be, but before he said that, he said, have you, when he saw him and they saw him dressed like that, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now watch, if you get the Holy Spirit when you get born again, why is Apostle Paul asking that question? Have you received Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we haven't even heard if there was such a Holy Spirit. He said, what were you guys baptized into? He said, John. He said, John, oh, okay. He was the forerunner. He, and from that place he preached Jesus. It said they were all baptized in the name of the Lord. That's that pool out there. And then Paul laid hands on them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Ain't that something? In, in Acts 8, Peter and John traveled 35 to 50 miles on foot. On foot. To pray for the Samaritans because he heard that all of Samaria got born again. But they heard that Holy Spirit had come upon none of them yet. You say, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I believe. Wait a minute. Your, your Bible doesn't say that it's an automatic thing. He, he said he had come upon none of them that it was so important to Peter and John that they traveled. It wasn't like they didn't jump in no car. 35 to 50 miles. They traveled to Samaria, and when they got there, they laid hands on them, and Holy Spirit came upon them all. 
Now in Acts 10, he's preaching to Cornelius' house, Peter. And as they heard the word, their hearts opened. They went, whoa, Holy Spirit just came on them all. And they all start praying in tongues and prophesying and worshiping God. And Peter said, woo-hoo, same spirit came on them that came on us. We forbid them water. And they took them over to that pool. Yeah. <laughs> the book of Luke says this, Luke 11. If we being of evil nature know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Father... Give the Holy Spirit to them that if he's automatic, why do you ask? Scripture answers everything. Contention answers very little. And opinions are way out of the box. Scripture answers everything. So I felt like it was important today in Freedom Fest and all the things we're sharing and hearing and walking in the light. To know that we've been baptized in Holy Spirit and. And that we've been empowered to be a witness. And, and actually listen to this scripture I just quoted. If we being of evil nature know how to give good gifts to our children. How much will Holy Spirit give. Will Father give the Holy Spirit to them that. So if we ask is he coming. 100% guarantee. So the evidence of receiving Holy Spirit is the asking. What we say is, well, if you ain't ever prayed in no tongues, you ain't, you probably ain't even born again. And you need to clean up that vessel so Holy Spirit comes. There's all that stuff's out there. And we've made it all about tongues instead of all about transformation and empowerment. And then people get a soul struggle. And then some people say, say yabba dabba do backwards three times. And you'll get it, brother. And they had like a bad experience and it's all about tongues. Tongues is very important and beautiful. I got saved on Sunday night. I woke up Monday morning in my bedroom. The presence of God was so evident. And I was praying in tongues loud and clear and crying and didn't have a clue what was going on. And I've been a little gone since that day. <laughs> I was just. Crying. And then I just started to sing and I found where Paul sang in, in, in other tongues and sang with his understanding and prayed in other tongues and prayed with his understanding. And all of a sudden I realized if I pray in another tongue, who? I. He doesn't control me. It's just in me. It's, it's, it's an ability, a gift given by God. If I pray in another tongue, my spirit prayeth. It says he who prays in another tongue, he builds up himself and he edifies himself you say well i don't like that praying in tongues you can't understand i can't even understand what you're saying well it's not for you it's just between him and me it's my spirit praying now tongues and interpretation is a whole different thing that's equivalent to prophecy but if you walk in on me in a, in a prayer time and i'm just kneeling or i'm sitting here and i'm just praying in tongues you should never be bothered by that because it's not for you. You say, well, I don't get nothing out of that. It's not for you. It's for me. Build myself up. Just, I'll just drive in the truck. And then all of a sudden, I start English coming. Now I'm having this communion with the Lord. My spirit's inspiring understanding. And next thing you know, I'm singing. And then a song comes out. And then I sing in tongues. And then a whole other paragraph. And you think you're a songwriter, but you're just worshiping God. And ain't nobody in the car. But Jesus. Yeah. I prayed for this man. He didn't pray in other tongues. He's on the phone. I said, pray. And he said, woo. I said, Spirit of God upon you. He said, man, I actually feel the Lord coming upon you. I don't even preach feelings. He said, whoo. I said, listen. I said, I know you've been taught this and that about other tongues. He said, listen, man, it's in you. This, this language, it comes from him. He's a person. He's not in it. He's Holy Spirit. Just thank him. He said, thank you. I said, now pray with me. And I just start praying in tongues. I said, won't be, you won't be repeating me. It'll be your own language. He never prayed in tongues. So he had so much teaching about things and it's of the devil and da, 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 da. So that night he goes to bed. He calls me. It's like, it's late. And I said, what's going on? He said, man, I got, I got all these words. They're just going. They feel like they're in my head. They feel like they're in my stomach. I don't even know where they're at. I got all these words. 
But he said, I'm afraid to speak them because I just don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be the devil. I'm like, I said, are they in you right now? These words, he said, I got words. I said, come on, man. He went, he's just going crazy on the phone, right? So I said, woo, I'm glad we got that out. He was like, so you know what we did? I stayed on the phone with him for 15, 20 minutes. We sang like three different songs in other tongues. We just sang and he's singing and crying. And, and then I start interpreting his song and I'm praying in tongues and he starts praying in English. Doesn't even realize he's saying what I'm saying. It just was powerful. If I would say in this room, would you mind playing some keys? You've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of praying in tongues. You've never, you've never received the person of Holy Spirit in your life where he's a person to come to be. He comes to be your best friend. You can read John 14, 15, 16. He talks, Jesus talks about he's coming. He's another. The word zalos in the Greek, it means just like me. He's the same kind as. What he's saying is he'll do in my absence what I would do if I was here. He said he'll show you things to come. He'll... Bear witness of me. He'll bring me glory. He'll be our friend. He'll lead us in truth. He'll only speak that which he hears, which means you're going to hear him. My sheep hear and obey my voice. How are they hearing his voice? Through the person of Holy Spirit. Talk to him often. Receive him today. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, my pastor's wife, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she believed, she believed she received him. She didn't pray in tongues. She was in two meetings where they tried to make her say stuff that she felt like was gibberish. And she got freaked out and shut down. So now she's in the service and her heart was touched and she wanted everything God had. So she just believed Holy Spirit came upon her and was in her life. So for a couple months, she talked to Holy Spirit and, and appreciated him in her life and woke up. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I appreciate you in me today. Man, I'm just going to read. Is there anything specific you would desire me to read? And, and if someone would come in our heart, she'd read it. Thank you for revealing this to me. The way you give men revelation over the generations. Open up my heart and help me to see. I so appreciate you leading my life and guiding my... She began to be friends with this person called Holy Spirit. She had never prayed in other tongues. Her husband called one day from out of town. He was crying. She never saw her husband cry. Strong personality. She never saw him cry. She was young. He was out of town. She couldn't be there. Young wife. He had to hang up abruptly in tears. And she didn't know what to do. And she's pacing and crying and praying. And in the middle of somewhere, all that was going on. She found herself kneeling at the couch praying in other tongues. Because the heart cry that was in her for her husband outweighed the soul struggle from all the bad experience. And he just broke through. And she was just Whoa! powerful. You catch me in my house running through the house like a madman. <laughs> Praying louder than the human voice should be able to speak. And you can't understand a word. <laughs> Don't get bothered by that. It's not for you. <laughs> you say, well, I don't even know what you're saying. Doesn't matter. It builds me up. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you've never received Him and ever prayed in other tongues, I want you to come on up here. I felt like it was important today. Just come on up here. If you're being water baptized and you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, oh my goodness, come up here. Don't wait till you're water baptized. Get on up here. Come on up here. Just line up up here. Make room. Just get on up here. Just start to prepare your heart. Just, just start to talk to Him and thank Him that He's here. Come on, people. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've never been endued with power, to be a witness. Come on. It's not scary. He's not scary. He's amazing. Thank Him that He loves you. Thank Him that He's here. Thank Him that He wants to fill you with all that He is. So start to talk to Him right now personally a little bit. And just say, Father, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just tell Him that from your heart. Tell Him, I want to be empowered. I want to be endued. I want to be a witness. I want my light to so shine. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and empower me? Come on, I need you up here. I'm still waiting on a couple. I'm just waiting on a few. 
Thank you guys. Appreciate you coming. David, you got some prayer folks, some people that are school folks or something, they'll just line up with me and stand and, and just encourage you in a minute. We'll pray in a minute. Thank you, God. I'm still waiting on a couple people. I need some people to come up here for prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know I got a lot of prayer folks coming, but I needed a few. Is this, are you girls, are you, are my Tennessee girls coming? Good. I just felt like I, I was going to say, I need like three or, or four people. But I looked over and saw y'all lining up. I think I said, I think it's them. Thank you for coming. Do we got any more that need to come? You've never been prayed for for the baptism of Holy Spirit. I need you to get up here quickly. I've been baptized, but I feel like I, I want to do it again. Oh, okay, I don't want to break the rules. <laughs> you just stand here. It'll be good. <laughs> just stay here. Yeah. You can stay here, honey. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna pray for you. Listen. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, he will come. Did you get that? A hundred percent. He loves you and he wants to empower you. A hundred percent. If you ask, is he coming? Yes. He's coming. So what I want to do, we're going to pray and you're going to ask him to come. And the people standing behind you are going to say, Holy Spirit, thank you for coming. He's going to come. Some of you are going to feel things some of you might not feel things it's not about feeling things we're not living for a moment we're living for a truth are you following me you believe him the other tongues i don't want anybody to be bothered by that we're going to begin to pray for you the people behind you are just going to softly pray in other tongues you'll just pray in other tongues don't fight it don't try to do it don't make it up he gives you utterance It'll come out of your mouth. You just pray it. It'll be there. Don't hold it back or you'll blow up. I'm telling you. So the, the prayer language is here. I'm telling you, we're going to pray in other tongues. If you feel like you're struggling, I don't want you to struggle. I don't want you to make nothing up. I want you to just thank Holy Spirit that he's here and empowering your life. Are you all ready? Say, Father, thank you for loving me, forgiving me of everything I've ever done. I want the baptism of Holy Spirit. I want the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire. I want the person of Holy Spirit to immerse my life, to fill my life with who you are. I want the evidence of other tongues. I want to speak divine mysteries. I want all that you have. Would you baptize me in your Holy Spirit in Jesus name? Pray right now guys that Holy Spirit come upon everyone. Holy Spirit come. Holy Spirit come. Come Holy Spirit come. <laughs> Holy Spirit come. It's okay. Holy Spirit come. Fill. Fill her. Fill her God. Fill her. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come. Come. <laughs> come. Come. Holy Spirit, come. Yes, fill. 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 Shetaba Shandaba Baba Baka. Shondira Baka Sunday. Fill. Fill them, Holy Spirit, come. Thank you. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Fill them. Fill them. Start praying in tongues behind them. If you have your prayer language, pray. Fill them. Holy Spirit, come. To be a witness, God. Empowered. Filled with you. Fill. Fill. Fill them, fill them, fill, 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 in Jesus' name, good God, fill your kids, filled with Holy Spirit, fill them God, fill them God, <laughs> fill, fill them, fill them Lord, fill them Lord, fill them Lord, fill them Lord, fill them Lord. Fill them together, God. Holy Spirit.
Spirit, come. Thank you. Be filled with Holy Spirit. Fill in Jesus' name. Fill in Jesus' name. Fill her, Lord. Fill her, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Empower your people. Touch your God in a special, special way. Intimate, Lord. Personal, Lord. And empower her to be a witness. Let her heart go free, God, in every way. Take away hurt, pain, memory, God. Take it all away. And let her see you like never before. Holy Spirit, come and empower her. Start to thank him. Talk to him. If you're standing up here, thank him for loving you. Be filled in Jesus' name. Be filled in Jesus' name. Be filled and empowered with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Yeah. Come, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fill them. Fill this family. Fill this couple. And bless this home. Fill them, God. Holy Spirit, thank you for unity. Thank you for oneness. Thank you for synergism. Thank you for restoration, God. Thank you for making things new. First love, fresh spark, fire, God. Let it burn in their hearts and let it be all they can see. All they can see, consume their eyes, consume their ears, and overtake their hearts. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, come. Prayer. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come and burn in him and just set his heart aflame. Holy Spirit, come and baptize him in the Holy Spirit and fire. A fire that purifies and purges. A fire that ignites and burns, God. Let the effect of your holy fire burn in his life. And let him stay a burning flame in Jesus' name. Yeah. 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 Talk to him. Thank him that he's in your life. Please talk to him. Say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I receive you. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for being here. You'll never leave me. You're with me for good. I'm all in. And you're all in me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.